Have a seat. Have a seat. And uh, being an overseer after the service, I'll be waiting in the concourse or the lobby. And if you have complaints or issues, I'll have a little table there. And just come talk to me. We'll just fellowship. And, but I just want to tell you that we just love you. We love Seacoast. We love everything about Charleston. We love everything about the Surratts. We love everything about your dream team. And I've already told my church, we 18 years ago planted Celebration Church. And I said, I am out of here. As soon as God releases me, I'm going from weirdo Austin to a really cool place called Charleston. And how many know you're blessed to be in this church and you were blessed to be in Charleston? This is an amazing place. And uh, South Carolina is very near and dear to me. The first time that I ever prayed actually to say, Jesus, be my Lord and Savior, was at Furman University in Greenville, South Carolina, where my father at that time was coaching. NFL stands for not for long. And so for that time, we were not for long in Atlanta during the grit blitz years. And two players, Greg Brzee and Ralph Ortega, led me to led me to pray. In fact, when two NFL players tell you, get on your knees and you're going to pray and go to heaven, I did. And... Uh, Whether it was going to be real or not, I prayed in that little room, that dorm room there in Greenville, South Carolina in the summer of 1978. And I want to say thank you for being my birthplace. South Carolina is my birthplace, if you will, in the kingdom of God. It's also near and dear to me because the last football game I played in was against the South Carolina Gamecocks in the Gator Bowl, and we just killed you guys. And... uh, (laughs) That game was in January of uh, 88. How many were there? Did we have anybody back in the... See, y'all don't claim South Carolina Gamecocks as your team. It's all Clemson now. Anyway, with that being said, I, uh, I want to give you just an illustration. I know that uh, the Surratts, Pastor Greg, is one of the, literally, one of the greatest leaders in the world. That's, that's not stretching. That is not uh, hyping. That's not uh, elaborating or just making something up. He's one of the greatest leaders... In the world, there's not a leader in the world that does know about does not know about Pastor Greg's leadership giftings and um, about his family, about you, his family. And uh, let me just give you a difference between his leadership and my leadership. And that is when I said, uh, Pastor Greg, we're going to do our dedication, and, and he goes, I'm, I'm going to come. And and uh, I said, Well, great, you're going to preach for me. And I want to be there. I don't know if I'm going to be able to be there on that night, but I'm going to be there. In fact, he came on that Saturday night. And it was actually the dedication, but he couldn't stay for Sunday. And I said, well, I want you to preach. He says, no. And that was it. He hung up the phone. (laughs) And here's the difference. I called him and said, hey, I'm coming, Josh. I'm coming to be just to be at the dedication. They go, then guess what? You're going to preach. And that was it. And so anyway, I'm doing what I've been told to do by your leader. The second thing I want to say is that when we moved into our new building, I know you guys had a few electricity issues, and uh, you never know if we're going to finish this service in the light or in the dark. And, uh, but you got something better than what we had. In fact, it's still going on two years later. And that is we have plumbing problems. And the problem is with our city as well, and the city has not run enough water into our, into our facility. And uh, which means you might have to flush three or four times every time you go to the bathroom. So what would you pick? Would you rather electrical problems or plumbing problems? You guys have no problems in this place. How many are thankful for the grace of God only in electricity issues? And so with that, more seats mean more stories. That's all it means. More seats means more stories. This does not mean... We're going to have more people, therefore maybe, maybe I won't be as noticed as I was in the previous building. No, All it simply means is that there's going to be more people to have an encounter with God. In fact, that's just all that is taking place in this building. And I can tell you, two years later now, going from approximately the same size building, about a 1,400-seat sanctuary, to now what is just a little less than 3,000 people, and that is our church has actually grown smaller as it has grown larger. And that is the church has found its, if you will, its rhythm. It's, it's found its pace. And, and Charleston, how many, how many know? In fact, the fact is, I think Charleston is growing numerically. Would you guys agree with me? Yeah. Well, guess what? Seacoast, you've always stayed ahead of the game. And if we did not do what we did two years ago, if we did not expand to the 3,000-seat sanctuary, 
we would have missed what God is doing in our church because what's happening around our church is just one new subdivision after another. Just one new street that's being developed. More and more people are moving. Half the problem, though, is that half of them are coming from California. And so the reality is we've had to, we've had to just stay ahead of the growth. And that's all this means is that a new building and a new worship space just simply means that we are gonna have new opportunity to hear new stories, and that's all it means for you. And so I just wanna say to you, and I wanna commend you, and as has been said before, that when church is as good as Seacoast is, when you guys have such an amazing worship team, an amazing worship space, you're gonna wanna come home on the weekends. How many would agree with me? You're just gonna say, God, can I go back and just visit every now and then? and get a little taste of the low country. I'm looking forward to find out what the food is. I have never, uh, in fact, I don't know what low country food is or what that means, but it sounds really good to me, and I hope it includes soul food. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 20, 28. And as you're turning there to the book of Genesis, I wanna ask you a question. If I told you that somewhere on the planet if I were to give them information, breaking news, if you will, that there is a place on the planet that would be literally a gateway, a door into heaven. And that if you got to that gate, if you got your friends to that gate, you got your family to that gate, to that door, to that place, and that by entering in that gate, it, it would give you access into heaven forever and ever with God. I'm going to ask you a question. Would you probably do whatever you could to get whoever you know, even maybe some of your enemies, you would do whatever you could do and you would do whatever you would have to do, no matter how hard and no matter how difficult and no matter the cost, wherever that place is, you would make sure that you got to that place, that gateway, that door, that entrance, that portal into the kingdom of of God. In fact, if it was on the North Pole, you would probably figure out a way. Or if it was on the South Pole, you would probably figure a way. Or if it was at the top of Mount Everest, or, or maybe we can say even if that, that gateway was in a desert, like, like the Mojave Desert or, or Death Valley, you, you would do whatever was necessary because eternity forever in heaven is the reason we all want to make sure that we don't we don't miss this point. In fact, that's, that really is what life is all about. And what's even better than that is, and what you gotta understand is that religion says, well, you know, that's where God would put it. Religion says if, if it's God, it's gonna be hard to find. It's gonna be on the North Pole. It's gonna be on the South Pole. It's gonna, it's gonna be in a desert region. That's what religion says. But here's the good news. God doesn't put a gateway in hard places to reach. He puts it in cities and neighborhoods. And he puts them all over in places where people can find and connect. And this is what I want to talk to you about today and to all the campuses is that God has put a gateway called the church in the earth and it is not hard to find. It is not hard to connect to. It is not hard to go to. You don't have to suffer trying to find it. You don't have to pay a big price. You don't have to travel around the world so that you can get you or your family or your friends there because God has put a gateway and it's called Seacoast right in your backyard. And I want you to see this with me because there's a scripture that actually says this. In Genesis 28, now Jacob went out from Beersheba and he went to Haran and literally he was on a run. He was fleeing for his life from his brother. Esau. And he came to a certain place and he stayed there all night long because the sun had set and he took one of the stones of that place and he, and he put it at his head and he went to sleep. He laid down in that place and he began to go to sleep. And then he dreamed. And in that place, he began to dream and behold, there was a ladder that was set up on earth and its top reached to heaven and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and he said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, and the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as, as the dust. You shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, Jacob, I am with you, you 
and will keep you wherever you go and bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. There's just a little, in fact, let me give you a little commentary. I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. I am not gonna leave you alone until I've accomplished my will for your life. And maybe you're here wondering, God, why won't you leave me alone? Why don't you just stop speaking to me? Why don't you just stop giving me signs and wonders? And, and why don't you just, God, just leave and just let me live my life? And God says, like Jacob, I will not leave you alone until I am done with you. And I'm not going to quit working in your life. I can just tell you, being a young man that was not raised in church, God, God would not leave me alone until he began to accomplish and still is what he has planned for my life. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep, watch this, and he said, surely the Lord is in this place. I did not know it. In fact, I know some pastors. They need to quote this same scripture. And then it says, and he was afraid, and then he goes, or fearful, but not fearful as in scared, but, but he recognized, he, he reverently understood this was God, and then watch what he says. How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And watch, this is the gate of heaven. This is the doorway to heaven. Now watch, Jacob got up early that next morning, took the stone that he had put in his head, set it up as a pillar, poured oil on top, and he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city had been called Luz previously. Then Jacob made a vow. And then he said, God, if you'll be with me and keep me on this way that I am now going... Give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I can come back to my father's house in peace. Then God, you shall be my God. And this stone now, which I have set up as a pillar, shall be God's house. And all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Now, before you begin to think, well, Pastor Joe, that gateway to heaven is an Old Testament story. It's an Old Testament theological position let me bring you now to Paul the Apostle who was writing to a man, in fact, a mentor E of his by the name of Timothy, and he says this to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Timothy, if I am delayed, in the Greek it literally means if I get stuck on my way to Charleston in Atlanta, I want to say something to you. It seems like that is a common situation around this point. He says, if I am stuck, if I am delayed, if I'm not able to get to you as fast as I want to get to you, I've got to say this. In fact, I'm writing this now. I don't want to wait till a face-to-face -face conversation. I don't want you to miss this point. Timothy's probably a 40-year-old pastor at this time. And he's actually struggling as a pastor. He's, he's probably struggling in many ways in his leadership. In fact, he is. He's struggling in his confidence. He's struggling in his, in his vision. And maybe you're here today and you've got a little confidence issue. Maybe you've got a vision issue. Maybe there's a little struggle going on even, frankly, in your faith. And he goes, I want you to get this point, Timothy, in case I am delayed. What I'm about to say to you, and this is true, I, I cannot wait. And you cannot wait to hear this. He says this, because it's going to affect everything about you. In fact, I think it's going to affect your confidence. I think it's going to affect your vision. I think it's going to affect your, your stance, your walk, your, your, your life. He goes, I write this to you so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of all truth. What literally Paul the apostle is saying is the exact same words that Jacob used to describe in Genesis 28. It is Paul's exact words that he would describe about the church in the New Testament. And that is just as Jacob erected that pillar and said, this is the house of God. This is the place. This is the location that changed my life. Paul the apostle is saying, Timothy, I think what you need to do, watch this, in order to have a conduct change, in order for some things to shift, in order for some things to begin to take place in your life, your issue might be in relationship to the house of God. And I can tell you that in every situation in my life, and when I find myself struggling, when I find myself maybe a little, uh, just if you will, just a little slow behind the eight ball, 
And I know half of that is because I went to LSU on a football scholarship. In fact, that's most of it. It is, and it has been always in relationship to the house of God. That when I, like the prodigal, begin to drift from the house of the father, I, like that prodigal, the farther I get away from the house, things just don't seem to go as well as I'd like for them to go. Because what God has said both in the Old and the New Testament, in fact, let me say it like this. Through arguably one of the greatest men that we know of in the scriptures, Jacob, who became, later on we'll close it out with this, he became who? Jacob was turned into Israel. The nation of Israel comes out of Jacob. And most of our New Testament scriptures comes out of Paul the Apostle. Probably, arguably, the greatest man that ever walked the planet, Paul. Saul, who became Paul. Jacob, who became Israel. But at the same time, I think it's interesting that if there are two notorious sinners that God used in the most dramatic way, it would be Jacob and it would be Paul. And both of them knew and both of them wrote eloquently, but they wrote from an experiential place that who they are was because of the house of God. And who they are as it relates to this world and as it relates to their calling is in relationship to the house of God. And I want to say to you that God over and over throughout the Old and the New Testament says to us consistently. In fact, Jesus said as he was walking this planet for those 33 years and for those three years publicly, he kept describing to his disciples the reason for his destiny and that is I'm here to build the church. And I'm here to put on the planet a gateway to heaven. Yes, I understand Jesus is the door. Yes, he says no one can come to the Father unless they come through me. I am the only way. I am the only truth. I am the only life. I am the only route. But Jesus has also given you and he's given me and he's given Seacoast and he's given Celebration Church the responsibility as his body on the earth to be that gateway for the next generation. And the reason why this building needed to be built was that God wanted a bigger door and a bigger gateway and a bigger place for people to find the bigness of God. Can somebody say amen with me on this Saturday night and wherever you're watching today. And God says, I really want to make sure that gateways are everywhere. In fact, I don't want it to be hard for people to find my church. My mom was raised Catholic. My dad was raised Baptist. That meant we were nothing. That meant, that meant there was a fight. <laughs> but to be honest with you, my mother, she had, she had some difficult experiences in her, in her upbringing. My dad had difficult experiences in, in his upbringing. And, and by the time I'm born in 1964, my two older brothers who had been raised semi, if you will, in church and in Sunday school, by the time I'm born, which is 10 and 12 years later than them, My mom and dad were done with church. You know why? They said it was too hard. It was too difficult. It was too much drama. It was just, it was just dysfunctional. Oftentimes people will say, and I'm saying it because this is what's being being said about churches like Seacoast. We're big enough. And Pastor Joe, there's just enough people. And of course, if there's one person going to hell within the neighborhood of Seacoast, it's not big enough. And number two, I would say to our people, when they say, we got enough people, I'd say, well, what dysfunctional thing do you want us to start incorporating into our lives? What stupid thing do you want us to do to stop people from coming? I can be weird if that's what you want. We'll be weird. Some of you are like, well, you're already weird. But the reality is, if we're doing what God wants us to do, guess what? We're going to become a gateway. And let me just bring it down to you individually. You are a gateway. In fact, the sign that you have matured And the sign that you're a real disciple is that you move from being someone that is just an intaker to now a gateway. It's it's instead of just being a receiver, you now take responsibility. That's what it means to be a disciple. Is that God, since you made a way for me, I do whatever I can through my giving, through my serving, through my prayers, through my attendance, through my words, through my invites, through telling my friends, telling my family, telling my neighbors, God, if you, if you did what you did through Greg Berzina and Ralph Ortega, 
Or Peggy and Jack Benson, they made a gateway for me. God, I, I want to make a gateway for other people. And what I want to give you in the next few moments before we go, I want to give you why it is called a gateway into heaven. Because I really do believe that we need to say like Jacob. And in fact, if we really have seen what God has for the church, we will say like Jacob, how awesome is this place? Not how difficult is this place, not how hard is this place, or how, how dead is this place, but how exciting in this place. And I think Jacob was saying it from maybe an experience that he had in a church that he previously experienced. Maybe he said, how awesome this place and God is here. In other words, I didn't know it could be this good. I didn't know that it could be this awesome. This is what I want to do with the rest of my life. And really, wherever you are in your journey with Christ, and maybe that doesn't mean you're going to be called a pastor or be in full-time ministry, but you are still called to be a gateway in your location. We need to see what both Paul and Jacob said. This is the house of God. This is the truth, the pillar and the ground of truth. I want you to see what they were saying. Watch this. This is positive. Everything about God is positive. God doesn't believe in negatives. Oh, we might say, well, Pastor Joe, God does some pretty awesome things in the Old and New Testament. The, the, there is with God, um, there's some fearful things that you could take as negative. There, there were some judgments in the Old and New Testament you could take. That's not negative. Negative in the sense that God abhorbs, if you will, vacuums. God is not into empty spaces. He is, he's a God that fills. Paul the Apostle would write over and over that you would be filled with the Holy Spirit, that out of your bellies will flow rivers of living water. God does not like empty spaces. This is, this, is, this is what God thinks about. This is what God moves for, is to fill the earth. May the whole earth be filled with what? With the, with the glory of God. Let everything that has breath do what? Praise God. So you know whether it's theologically, God is a God who is not into negative. He's not into vacuums. He, He's always going to be filling. That's what he was saying to Jacob. Jacob, I'm going to fill your life. And when I fill your life, it is going to accomplish what I have created you for. I'm not going to stop filling you. I'm not going to stop moving in you. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to let you go. And what we got to see through these points that I want to give you today is this is precisely why God came. Because if there was anybody that needed an encounter, it was Jacob. Jacob's name means deceiver, supplanter. He would flat scheme you out of everything if you had known the Jacob before he had an encounter with God. He would have robbed you blind. He would have taken your watch right. He was just like you would have seen anybody in New York City or some other big, large city around the world. They will, they will strip you. They will, they will have everything off of you before you even know it. And that was Jacob. He was not a good dude. But the interesting thing about Jacob is that Jacob understood God. Jacob, Jacob wanted God. And Jacob had stolen the birthright. He had stolen the blessing from his brother Esau. By lying to his father, dressing up like he was a hunter, dressing up as though he had come in from the outdoors and he put on everything that Jake, uh, Jacob's brother would have had on. He, he made himself smell like his brother Esau. And, and of course, he goes, man, you, you, you sound like Jacob, but you feel like Esau. And of course, he's all dressed up in a costume. And he goes, oh, it's, it's me. <laughs> and of course, Jacob was a man of the tents. He's probably talking more like this. It's me. And, and then he realized. And then, of course, he took his brother's blessing by deception. And now game's on. Esau wants to kill him. Esau's a hunter. Esau knows how to wield a sword. Esau's going to take him out. Esau's going to fillet him and have him as beef jerky as soon as he can. And his mother, Jacob's mother, says, run for your life. And that's where we pick up the story. He is on now this run. He's fleeing. But I don't care how fast you think you are running. And I don't care where you think you are. Just look at your hand for a moment. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Let me just tell you. I don't care what you think about God. You to God is like you looking at your hand. And that's God looking at you. Oh, look, he's running to the pinky. Oh, he's running to the thumb. Oh, look, he's running to the middle finger. I won't go there. The reality is, 
Where are you going? How far do you think you can go? How, how fast do you think you can run? And now the Bible tells us here is Jacob sleeping. And this is what he has. Number one, he has an encounter. And the first point I want you to see is the church is the gateway to a God encounter. And this is what Jacob said was, this is awesome. And that gateway or that encounter in that gateway called this church that he described was frankly this. Here it is. You can really bring it down to this one point. Grace. He didn't kill him. He didn't wipe him out. He didn't torture him. He didn't rebuke him. He didn't correct him. Let me just tell you what he told about him. He says, I got some amazing things for you. All I have for you, Jacob, is grace. All I want to do in your life is grace you. And I think Jacob, when he said, how awesome is this place? Is he goes, that's not what I've heard about church. That, that, that has not been my encounter. Because the last, maybe the last church I showed up, in fact, one of our members years ago, when a person that I had been working on for a long time came to church, and this person was like a Jacob. This person was known in the Austin area for having done some things. And a person who I know, and in fact, her and her husband have been in our church for a long time. I was standing when this happened, and when they saw who it was in church sitting next to me, she turned and said to the friend that I invited, I wouldn't have expected a person like you to ever come to church. What are you doing here? And I grabbed that family, and I had a come to Jesus meeting. In fact, I just said, God is not negative. Yes, he was. In that moment, he was negative because I got negative. And I said, if I ever hear out of your mouth, and if I ever hear anyone ever say, in fact, I had a teaching moment with the whole church, if anyone ever comes to our church and we say to somebody, what are you doing here? My response to you is, what are you doing here? Because if it wasn't for the God of grace, who deserves? In fact, who has the right to have an encounter with God? How many would agree with me that whatever we have of God is by his grace, it's by his mercy, it's by his love, it's by his choosing. And who are we to be gatekeepers? We are not to be gatekeepers. We are to be gateways for God. And when people come into church, please, you may say, I have never seen that kind of tattoo before. Don't say it. You can think about it. Come to Austin. I will show you some stuff. But the reality is, is that they needed a God encounter. Jacob did not need to be corrected. He needed to see how awesome God was. And he wasn't struck with deafness or blindness. He wasn't struck with judgment. He was struck with grace and it seized him forever and it changed him forever. And what has to happen, Seacoast, in this new building are God encounters like you guys are already having and experiencing in this place. Can somebody say amen with me? That deceiver, that swindler, he had an encounter. He had an encounter, if you will. And let me just give you a couple of the encounters. Number one, it's the unholy with the holy. Jacob was an unholy man. And the Bible describes in the literal Hebrew, this is called a holy place. The word certain place means holy. This was holy. And I'm not saying this building is holy, but when two or three are gathered together in his name, it becomes holy. And the holy in Christ came to this world. And then he said to the church, he said to you and he says to me, now be the church, be my body, be what I was to Jacob. That you're going to come into contact with unholy people. But what they need to realize is this is how awesome God is. That the wall, the veil that was torn when Jesus said it is finished was rent from top to bottom. And what does that say? It's no longer for holy people to come in. It's for unholy people to come in. And whosoever will, let him come. Whoever wants God can have a God encounter. It's also the natural with the supernatural. Jacob was a natural man. But the church is about a supernatural opportunity to meet the natural situations. It's the old with the new. Encountering the old with the new. 
God brought you here today to tell you, I don't want to do something old in your life. Behold, I want to do something new in your life. The promises of God, the grace of God, the mercies of God are new how often? Every, every morning, every day you wake up saying, God, what are you going to do new in my life today? Don't leave your house without saying, Lord, what new thing are you going to do in my life today? We also know it's the dead with the living. That man was as good as dead. And God encountered this Jacob with his life. Paul the apostle was told, you go and to preach, Paul, and I want you to bring the gospel, and I want you to turn those people that are dead into living beings. The Bible says, while we were dead in our trespasses, what did Christ do? He died for us to make us alive. It's also an encounter, the darkness with the light, opening up the eyes. And the Bible says, Jacob woke up and he saw. Number one, the church is the gateway to an encounter with God. And you can have as much of God as you want in this place even right now. Number two, the church is the gateway to a God dream. And the Bible says, he dreamed a dream. He had a dream. And what was the dream? He saw the heavens open and he saw a ladder descend and its top was reaching into heaven and its bottom was touching the earth. And what's interesting is he had this dream when the sun was setting. And just when you think the sun is setting on your life, God sets you up with a new dream. Pastor, I've been in this church for many, many years. In fact, I have been a part of this church almost since the beginning. It's amazing how many people, we've been there 18 years, say that they were with us in the beginning. And I said, we only had seven people. You weren't there, liar, liar, pants on fire. I don't know if it grows around here, but it's like, I wish you were there. And what God gives to this man, Jacob, is a dream. Let me say it like this, a purpose, a vision. A reason. You know what Jacob was? Jacob was a man out of control. And a purpose and a reason and a vision takes a man or a woman that is out of control and brings them back into the real world of God. In fact, let me tell you about a dream, a vision, a purpose. It's glue. Without a vision, what does the Bible say in the book of Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 18? Without a revelation or without a vision, what happens to all of us? We, we cast off restraint. But happy are the people who keep the law of vision. Happy are the people. Peaceful are the people is literally what it means. When you walk, listen, when you walk your life according to the law of your purpose, the law of your vision, the law of your calling, God in the book of Romans chapter eight, verse 28, the Bible says it like this. You are called according to what? We know that all things work together. And watch this. For good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to. Now read that. Called according to purpose. What does that mean? When God calls you, when God puts his hand on you, when God begins to squeeze you as you're running away from him, and when he begins to crowd you into his will or to his purpose, he calls you or he begins to massage you. He begins to work on you according to purpose. How many have ever had someone call you and go, hey, hey, what you doing? Uh, working. Uh, what are you doing? And you know what they're about to say. Nothing. What are you calling for? Nothing. What do you want? Nothing. So you're calling without a purpose. Yes. God doesn't do that. He doesn't go, hey, hey, God, what's up? Nothing. No, he hates vacuum. I just said that. He hates emptiness. He's never not working in your life. He's never not talking to you for purpose. He's never not working for purpose. He's never not arranging, orchestrating, organizing. And what Jacob sees is that his purpose in life has to do with God. And that what he realizes is that God gives him a dream. He gives a dreamless man a dream. And I promise you, if you'll just say, God, I want to live for what you have for me. I want to live for my purpose. I want to live for the calling of God upon my life. And listen, whatever that is, you know what it has to do with? Getting people to heaven. Number three, the church is the gateway to God's voice. 
I'm going to close around this point. The church is the gateway to God's voice as the worship team comes. And he heard God say to him, Jacob, I want to talk to you about what I have for you. I want to talk to you about prophetically the things that I have in store for you. I want to talk to you supernaturally. But listen, and this is true for the church. When you're in God's house, like Seacoast, you're going to hear the supernatural voice of God. In fact, 18 years ago, when we were getting, in fact, we were living in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, just, just waiting on God, serving God in the church, traveling a little bit here and there. And during a worship service, just like you just had a few minutes ago, wherever you are, whatever campus, it comes like this 18 years ago. It is Austin. Now, it's been hard sometimes, Pastor Greg and Josh. I thought maybe God at times during the hard times, well, maybe he just said it was awesome, just like Jacob. But I turned it into a a city. Or maybe he said it was Boston. At times, I really wondered, did God lead me to Boston? But I just thought it was Austin. And during a worship service, I heard it is Austin. Can I just tell you something? Never been the same since. And I went from living in Baton Rouge, really struggling, really hurting, really broken, to where I told my wife, Lori, I said, Lori, during service today, in fact, she was at home with our newborn baby, the third one at that time. And she, I said, Lori, I heard God, I think we're moving to Austin. I heard that day the supernatural direction of God that literally we would arrive in that city some four months later, 18 years later. There's a church like Seacoast, a gateway like Seacoast. And what I have said, and let me just tell you what your pastors say about you God, speak to your people supernaturally. Oh, speak to your people scripturally. Because God's voice comes supernaturally. But number two, how many know God's voice comes to us through the scriptures? And with every head bowed and every eye closed in this place today, you're going to have to come back tomorrow to hear the last two points. Because my Saturday people, I don't want to take any more of your time. With every head bowed and every eye closed in this place. How many are you, how many are here tonight and you'd say, or wherever you're watching. God, I want you to speak to me. I I need to hear a voice. I need to hear a word. I need to hear direction. I need to hear from you, God. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. And God, like you did for Jacob, would you speak to me all over this place? If that's you, would you just say, God, I need to hear from you. How many need to hear from the Lord tonight concerning a situation, concerning a problem, concerning an issue, concerning a loved one? Let me see your hand all over this place. How many want to hear from the Lord? Thank you so many. I want to ask it like this. You may put your hand down. How many, how many would say, Pastor Joe, I've heard enough from God. I don't need to hear from him again. Let me, I, I'm just curious. I want to see, I just want to see what, uh, what dysfunction looks like. <laughs> because Jesus said, nobody can live by bread alone. But everyone can live and must live by what? By the word or by the voice of God. And the Lord has brought you here today to tell you, like Jacob, I am not here to hurt you. I'm here to speak to you. Maybe you're here today and you're not like you're not like you're right with God. In fact, you're far away from God. You're running. You're out of control. And today, you want to say to the Lord, God, I hear you. My life is yours. If that's you, with head bowed, eyes closed, how many would say, today I want to receive Christ as my Lord. And say, today I want to submit to the call of God. I want to be saved. I want to submit my life. I want to be obedient to him. Would you just slip up your hand? I want to pray for you all over this place. Yeah, thank you so much. Hands all over this place. Jesus, I just thank you for these amazing men and women. But Lord, I am also thankful for the amazing grace of God that is in this place. And that, Lord, you only have one desire. And that is not to hurt us, to harm us, but to prosper us, to bless us, to grace us with eternal life. And I thank you, Lord that the best is yet to come in Jesus' name. And everybody said, can we thank God for his goodness and his mercy? Amen.